Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture. Over 200 hours of audio presentations are available on our website for you to download and burn to a CD for use in your car or home stereo, or to play on a portable player, such as an iPod. If you don't know how, visit our website for some instructions, or just listen to the presentations on your computer. Also available is a schedule of our upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. All this is available at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. The Troparion of Holy Pascha, which I passed out, is a traditional Byzantine hymn of the resurrection. We're going to be having a series on the Byzantine tradition in uh, just a couple of weeks. And so this is something that we have the honor to be able to sing. Father Joseph Francavilla from Holy Transfiguration Church is with us tonight. And so he's going to be leading us in this. We'll sing it three times. So if you don't know it, listen the first time and the second two times sing it. If you do know it, uh, feel free. Uh, please stand for the, for the hymn. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and under the ages of ages. Amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs be throwing love. Christ is risen. Indeed he is risen. Christ is risen. Indeed he is risen. Christ is risen. Indeed he is risen. Glory to his holy third day resurrection. We glorify his resurrection on the third day. Thank you, Father. If uh, for any of you this is your first time at, at the Institute of Catholic Culture, we are about Catholic culture at the Institute. And when Father Joseph and Father Charles are with us from our local Byzantine church, we have uh, an added grace. Uh, and we always make use of, of their gifts and the gifts of the Eastern churches. I just wanted to open quickly with a few words from our Holy Father. In our days, when in vast areas of the world the faith is in danger of dying out like a flame which no longer has fuel, the overriding priority is to make God present in this world and to show men and women the way to God. Today, it is up to you, brothers and sisters, to offer the risen Christ to your fellow citizens. Today, it is up to you to offer the risen Christ to your fellow citizens to your neighbors, to your friends, to the people you meet at the grocery store, to everybody we encounter. It is, must be, if we are Christians, our one goal to offer the risen Christ to them. Today, the talk is uh, co-sponsored by two organizations, the Institute of Catholic Culture, of which I am the director, and the Foundation for Sacred Arts, of which Anne Marr, who is here, is the director. Anne, please stand up. Please welcome Anne Marr. So I just wanted to say a few words about the Foundation for Sacred Arts. We are a Catholic nonprofit organization, and we work towards a recovery of beauty in the sacred arts. So sacred art, sacred architecture, and sacred music. We do this through educational programs such as these, through events which showcase beautiful sacred arts, and through resources for patrons. And we do all of this for the glory of God, as our mission statement says, for the glory of God, the life of his church, and the transformation of culture. We have uh, put brochures on each of your seats for more information and invite you to fill out a contact card if you would like to be included on our e-newsletters. And also, please visit our website. Uh, we're very blessed to have with us tonight a very accomplished scholar from Chicago, and he's here in Washington, D.C. to speak at Catholic University. Please welcome Dr. Dennis McNamara. Okay. Well, thank you very much for a rousing introduction. I don't usually have singing of Christ is Risen before a talk, but that is 
great, right? That's what we're here to talk about. And as Sabatino said, I, I am in town for the CUA Conference on Church Architecture, but I'm also a graduate of the University of Virginia and lived in Virginia for eight years. And I'm happy to see mountains and, well, hills at least, and trees after being in Illinois for the last 10 years. And uh, it's, it's really a delight uh, to be back. But I wanted to uh, start by telling a little story. You know, I'm an architectural historian by training, but I'm a Christian by faith, right? I'm not a, a biblical scholar. I never went to graduate school for theology. But on the other hand, I think that's helped me in a way because I want to be like St. Paul saying Christ is risen, not like somebody else who says, oh, guess what footnote six just said on the newest article or whatever. Those things are good, but that's not all there is. Oh, Hopefully we'll solve that problem. That's not all there is to say. And when I go out to uh, weddings of friends, you know, you always wind up sitting next to somebody's grandmother or whatever. And what do you do? Oh, well, I'm an architectural historian. Oh, what do you do? Oh, well, I help design churches. Oh. <laughs> and what do they say? Why does my church look like a bunker? How come when I was a kid the churches had statues in it? And why can't it look like that anymore? And so... You know, sort of like being a doctor, a medical doctor. I'm a medical doctor. Oh, you know, I have this backache. You know, what can, what can you tell me about it? It's that same kind of thing. Everybody's got a complaint about their church architecture. And I had to answer these questions. I know what I like, but is what I like what the church asks us to do? Is what I like what's the best thing? Is I like what I like evangelical? And then I started looking at church architecture and saying, hmm, there must be something more than what sort of just satisfies my emotional response. I have to think intellectually about what a church is. And I came to the realization that you can't just say old-fashioned stuff is good or modern stuff is good. New is good, old is good. You have to say, what is a church ontologically? And ontology is one of these $5 uh, seminary words that means being. What's the nature of something? So a dog has dogness, a table has tableness, this basket purse purse, has purseness, right? <laughs> now, if this were a car, it wouldn't be a very good purse, right? It should have all the qualities of purseness. So you have to say, what's a church? And for a long time, people said, well, a church is really a house. It's just a big house, grown large. The Acts of the Apostles says that the apostles went and broke bread in their homes, and so therefore, a church should be a living room, and it should look like your living room. And you see, this was really, you can guess when this theology was very strong, 1968, 74, 75, and into the 80s and 90s. But if you think about ontologically what a church is, it's more than that. It's a spiritual and sacramental reality a lot of which is very clearly articulated by the Eastern churches. The Byzantine Orthodox churches have a very strong positive theology of art and architecture versus the West. Does anybody know what Vatican II says about statues and images? You read this sex. It says, statues should be, or images should be retained for the veneration of the faithful. That sounds good. However, care should be taken that they're asserted in right order so it doesn't corrupt. It's some, not corrupt, but so that the faithful, the faith is not distorted in any way. It's a nice, n nice enough thing. We don't want distortion of the faith. But where's the positive theology of imagery? Where's the positive theology of the sacramental revelation of angels and saints in our, uh, in our sacramental existence? And you know, when I was talking a second ago about Vatican II, I'm not trying to beat up Vatican II. I was just trying to use it as an example of how in the, in the Western church, we often don't know what a, a theology of imagery and a theology of church architecture is supposed to be. So well, let's start with a quiz here. Please raise your hand. Is this a prison? If you think it's a prison, raise your hand. Okay, we got one, two, three, four, five. If you think it's a parking garage, raise your hand. A lot of hands. Is it, is it a church? Oh, you cynical people, you cynical people. Well, that's because you've seen some things that don't always look like churches. How about this? Is this a prison? Parking garage? Oh, parking, it's a nice prison. Parking garage? Church? Yes. Okay, so you are all architectural experts in the semiotics of architecture. Right? Semiotics means the sign value. It's what highbrow professors talk about all the time. Semiotics, sign theory, symbol theory. You don't have to study this in university to figure this out. You have the sense of what a church is. It's part of our conventional heritage. You stop at red lights and you go at green lights. It's in the culture. It's what you do. It's part of our convention. And so you can say the same thing about architecture. This is a brand new church, by the way. It's just completed in Kansas City, Kansas. And the architect of this church was at the conference at 
Catholic University of America. It was good to see him again. I worked very closely with him on this project. So here's the comparison, right? This is the 1960s, which is supposed to be modern, right? And this is 2008, 2009, which is supposed to be more modern, and yet it doesn't look modern. So we have to ask the question, is modernism and architecture something that's good in itself, or do we have to think a little more about it? And one of the ways to think about how architecture can be read is shown by this uh, skyscraper church that's right in the downtown loop in Chicago. And in the 1920s, they got very worried that the skyscrapers that were full of offices were getting taller and taller and taller, and the church steeples weren't the tallest things on the skyline anymore. And they called these the temples of mammon because it was all about money and not about the cross being at the top of the skyline. So these industrious uh, Methodists got together and said, let's put a church in the bottom and a bunch of offices in between, and then we'll take Chartres Cathedral Tower and slam it on the roof, right? <laughs> because they wanted the cross to be the highest thing on the skyline. So not only can the building be read, but the cityscape can be read. It conveys information. In fact, they got permission from the city council to break the height ordinance. All buildings, none of them could be taller than this. And the city council, being Christian-minded, said yes. And they thought that all the planes coming into the airports would see the cross lit up, and that would be this beacon toward Chicago. Okay, let's see if you raise your hands on this. If you agree, raise your hand. Jesus' victory on the cross overcame sin and death. Okay, not too many abstentions there. All right, how about this? Nobody sins and nobody dies anymore. <laughs> Uh-oh. How do you solve this problem? This, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, we know all this. But we still go into confession, and we still need baptism. We're still needing divine life in the sacraments. So what do we do? Well, I don't I want to ask you to raise your hand. I'll just tell you. This is what the church tells us. We're in an in-between time when the victory of Christ is won. It's done. It's not going back. It's never going to fail. But we still feel the effects of sin. And you'll see in a second why this matters in relation to architecture. In the, shadow, in the um, Spirit of the Liturgy, the book that Pope Benedict wrote when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, he said, echoing St. Gregory the Great, that there were three periods of salvation history. The time of the shadow, that's the Old Testament. And so you can see my hand here makes a shadow. You would know that I have five fingers and it's a certain size, but you might not know more about my hand. So they're saying priests, prophets, kings, temples, all those things were preparing the way for Christ by way of shadow. And then there is a reality. There's a heavenly future that we're going to be in heaven and all of our sorrow and mourning and weeping will be over. And that's what we're really supposed to be. We're not supposed to be fallen. We're supposed to be glorified. And so that's what we're hoping to be. But we're in this in-between stage. So every time you hear about the pilgrimage church on its way somewhere, what that means is you're becoming more what you're supposed to be. So if you think of the uh, last time you went to the dentist and you had to get a filling, your tooth was missing part of its toothness, right? The reality of a tooth is no cavities. A less tooth than it should be has a cavity. And we as fallen but redeemed are waiting to become what we really are, which is filled with divine life in an eternal sense. And so you have Old Testament, you have heaven, but we participate in it now. And if you read the documents of Vatican II, you'll see lots of words like the foretaste of the heavenly liturgy, signs and symbols of the heavenly liturgy. We sing the praises of God with the choirs, the armies of angels and saints on earth now. That's what full, conscious, and active participation means, by the way. It doesn't so much mean, you know, giving things out and running here and there and being a lecturer, although those things are good. It means you get to participate in the worship of God as it exists in heaven so that you become more like it. You become heavenly, and then you're worthy to be there. But we're in this in-between time, and we have to figure out how we can experience that now. And unless you're a mystic and you get carried off to heavenly visions, um, I, I once gave a talk where I said, oh, of course, nobody in here is a mystic, so we have to look at a building. And, they, and some lady came up to me at the end and said, I'm a mystic. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I hope, did heaven look like what I said it did? Um, and I don't want to deny that she was, because I don't know. But I won't presume there are no mystics in the room. But since most of us aren't mystics, we have to know God through the medium of worldly matter. We are sensate beings. We know God through our senses. So the architecture, art and architecture, are how God reveals heavenliness to our eyes, right? Just as scripture reveals it to our ears. And so how does architecture do this? Well, the catechism tells us it building that shows the fulfillment of God's great deeds, so the fulfillment of the Old Testament. It's a sign of the church living in this place, 
And when um, Ann and I were driving in here, we passed right by and missed the entrance. And we said, oh, but it's over there. We saw that building. We said, oh, that must be the church, which means there must be Christians around here. Right? So that building is a sign that there are people reconciled with God who live in this area. And then it's the signs and symbols of heavenly realities, this foretaste of heaven. And as you know, it helps if it has bathrooms and an elevator and parking lots and all the things that we needed to have. All of this happens in the context of salvation history. We're going to go through the history of the world in two minutes or less. I'll set my watch. Okay, ready? What was in the beginning? Well, nothing was in the beginning. Well, there's no beginning, right? God's eternal. God has no beginning. There's a life of the Trinity. Life is, they're happy. They're a community of the persons of the Trinity. And just like a husband and wife who love each other, spring forth new life, out of the love of the persons of the Trinity uh, comes creation. They want to share this love with more and have it overflow. So Adam and Eve are created. They're happy in the garden, right? There's no church in the garden of Eden because they walk around easily in the cool of the evening with the Father. And the delight of God is to play with the children of men. And all is in right order. And that word order in Greek is cosmos. So if you put makeup on your face, cosmetics on your face this morning, you put order on your face, right? All those bedhead things that you wake up with, uh, you do your hair, you put order back in your face. But what happens to mess this up? Yeah, the fall, right? There's a rupture of the relationship with God. The relationship with God is disordered because chaos enters the world. So sin, disorder, chaos Nature falls as well, which is interesting. You know, we live in the time of the, the eco-green movement, but nature has fallen. The lion still eats the lamb, unlike the time when the lion and the lamb are going to lay down together and the lion will eat straw. And Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden. Doesn't seem like happy news, but there's always the positive sign of that, that coin, which is, oh, happy fault of Adam that you know, earned for us so great a savior. And so that's when the rescue mission of God begins. The preparation in the Old Testament, God reveals himself and restores cosmos to Adam and Jacob and Aaron and Moses. And what do most people say about the Ten Commandments? If you had to be a Saturday Night Live character and you were talking about the thou shalt not, what kind of thing would you do? What gesture would you make? Right? Church lady, thou shalt not do this. But think about this. If you have kids who are fighting, you say, stop pulling your sister's hair. Stop setting the drapes on fire, right? Stop killing people. Stop coveting your neighbor's goods. Stop coveting your neighbor's wife. All that stuff. This is a way to bring order back to creation. It is how to establish friendship with God again. So there's, I love the positive spirit in the room today, but that's a positive thing, the thou shalt not. But it's only in preparation. And right after the Ten Commandments, God gives a whole set of directions for building the tabernacle of Moses, which is this portable tent for worship. Very explicit directions. Silver clasps, gold clasps, bronze clasps, four different colors of fabric, animal skins. It's got proportions and different rooms and all this stuff. So how to live, then how to worship. And eventually that worship becomes more permanent in the Temple of Solomon. And so we can learn some lessons from that. And then, finally, the Incarnation. That God who was a lightning and power and thunder and a burning bush now comes as a person who can talk to us, to our ears, and address our senses. And this involves the restoration of creation as well. If you see uh, beautiful icons, in this case of the um, nativity, Christ is born in the midst of this dark cave. The darkness of the world and sin and the light comes just to the darkest places. And so if you never know on your Christmas cards if Christ was born in a cave or a barn, in the Middle East, in the Holy Land, they actually use caves as stables for animals. And they put a little fence out around the front so they can't run away. So it's a barn and it's a cave. And the cave is the symbol of this dark sin that is being overcome with light. And then all the things we know about the New Testament. Founding the church, and then Christ goes back to the Father, but sends the Holy Spirit, and the age of the church begins. And that's the age that we're in. So this is the you are here mark on the roadmap of life. You are here. Sometime after Pentecost but before the completion. This is the end of the world. And we think end of the world, scary music and earthquakes and destruction. No, no, no. The end of the world as we know it means that the application of Christ is complete and it's been restored and glorified and perfected. That's what we are looking for. And if you read the book of Revelation, there are these saints under the altar of God and they're saying, bring it, bring it, God. When, when will this be fixed? When will this be finished? Get all those people back to right relationship with you. And so the end of the world is it's a little scary if depending which side of the fence you fall on, right? But hopefully we're on the right side with God. And that's the reality that we want to experience. 
And that's the reality that art and architecture show us, or should show us. We can't envision it unless we're mystics, so we have to do it in architecture. And this little line here with the X's on it is, imagine this is the liturgy. If all this heavenly glory. Angels and saints are singing God's praises. There's no sin. There's no sorrow. No fighting. No death. It's radiant with the light of Christ. And that comes to us through the sacraments and we bring all of our efforts to it as well. Liturgical music isn't just, I feel happy today, God. I love you. Well, that's a nice start. But what do the angels and saints singing at the throne of God sound like? How can I hear the order, perfection, and harmony of the heavenly communities? And how by listening to them can I become used to them and conformed to them? What do they say? You have a kid who plays violent video games all day, kid becomes violent, right. You do heavenly all day, you become heavenly, and that's it. If you want to run a marathon, you don't sit at home and say, well, I can run marathons in my bedroom and get ready for the marathon. I can, I can pray at home. No, I get up and I run a half mile and it hurts and it's boring and I don't like it and I sweat and I don't like it. But then I do it every day until I can run a marathon and it becomes easy. I've mastered my passions, which don't want me to run, all the boring moments that kids have in a pew where you sit still, sit still, sit still. Right? That's just the beginning of them learning how to master their bodies so then they can concentrate. Who picks up the bulletin during Father's homilies? No, nobody here does, I know, but people do, right? It's work to concentrate. You have to discipline your minds. And the more beautiful it is, the easier it will be to do it. And that's why beauty is a very key component to art and architecture and liturgy in every stage. So think about all the senses you have. Your ears. We all pray in one voice in the church. You know, you're driving around here, people are cutting you off on Route 29 and road rage and gestures you shouldn't repeat in public and all that stuff. And then you come to church and everybody forms one body and with one voice sings Our Father who art in heaven. Right? That's an anticipation of the unity of the beings of heaven. And it's harmonic and it's ordered. Smell. Flowers. Incense. The Garden of Eden. The sweet smell of prayer. Touch. Wood silk, gold, stone, even the hand of your neighbor. It's a foretaste of the time when you will be in right relationship with everyone. And then, of course, seeing the, in sacramental form all the restored heavenly beings and their actions. And then, of course, uh, the transformed food and drink in the Eucharist to make it as it was in the beginning. Every time you say that, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, what you're praying for is the restoration of the world. And the liturgy is how you get good at it, by practicing it. Doing the world as the world was meant to be done, as they say. And the idea is to change the mourning and weeping in this valley of tears, Adam and Eve being chased out of the Garden of Eden, into a place where there is no mourning, no weeping, and everything is in right order. Uh, this is a, a mural in the Cathedral of Salt Lake City, the Cathedral of the Madeline. And maybe you can make out God the Father holding up the eternally crucified 
but beautiful uh, crucifixion and the Holy Spirit above, the angels catching the blood, the more angels, the saints, this is Eve over here, uh, Moses with the Ten Commandments, David and so on, and the white-robed elders, and the, even the stars in the sky look like big flowers bursting because the stars have been restored to the glory greater than they have today in the sky. And in case you think I'm making this up, this is in Vatican II, very clearly. There's John the 23rd, and there's Paul the 6th, and this is, this is Vatican II thinking. What does it say? Holy Mother Church has been a friend of the fine arts with a special aim that all things set apart for worship should be worthy, becoming, and beautiful, signs and symbols of heavenly realities. That's it. Every decision you make liturgically, is this more close or less close to what heaven might be like? Is it more close or less close to what I need to be doing to be conformed to heavenly realities? So this lends questions. What are signs? What are symbols? What are heavenly realities? Well, let's do a little work there. What do you do when you see one of those? Go really fast, right? No, you stop. It's a sign. It doesn't make you stop. A brick wall would make you stop, right? The stop sign is something else that refers back that you should stop. And it's red, and it's octagonal, but it could be green, and it could be round. It just happens to be red here. Now look at this nice lamppost here. What does that lamppost say about the town that it's in? Just guessing. Be brave. Traditional. They like old-timey stuff, right? Virginians understand this very well, I know. Mr. Jefferson's University and all. That lamp is a sign of the otherwise invisible values that the community holds. You can look at, it's a gas lamp. It doesn't light up anything, but it looks really cool at night. And so they have it. And look, there's a sign on the sign, and the sign is about signs, right? No parking between signs. <laughs> so there's a whole network of signs and symbols. That's how we know things. Even the voice is a, sim, is a sign, set of signs. English is a different set than French and German and Greek and all of that. And you have to have common understanding in conventions or else you can't understand each other. Have you heard this urban legend about these children that were found in a trailer in Appalachia that uh, they, the social workers came and they were speaking some language they never heard of and they brought them around to all these linguists until somebody in the office who was a Star, Star Trek fan realized they were speaking Klingon? <laughs> There's a Klingon dictionary. Somebody wrote it all out and then somebody said, I don't know if this is true, but see that Klingon language is not a conventional shared convention, which is why you can't just go and make a church be whatever you want it to be. It has to be conventionally understood because it's good for the whole and not just the individual. And check this out. This is just a couple things stuck to the side of a parish school. The coat of arms of the Archbishop, Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago, but then look who the real boss is, right? This is the clarity of the invisible hierarchical structure of the diocese represented in two simple little ornaments that are added to the building. Now I'll see if you can do this. Which one of these buildings is more important? This one or this one? Left or right? You've been here. Lake Forest, Illinois. Very swanky town, by the way. All the bankers have their houses up on Lake Michigan and Lake Forest, Illinois. And the city hall. That's the city hall. That's where governing happens. Governing is about bringing justice and order and peace to society. It's an important duty. This is the place where you buy newspapers and coffee to get on the train to go to work in the morning. You need them both but they have different places in the hierarchy, and the architecture tells you the civic life of this town. And you can see the church would be above even the city hall, ideally. Okay, so what are heavenly realities? Let's see if you can do this. What can you guess by reason? Heaven, ordered or disordered? Ordered. Centered on God or centered on something else? God. Empty or populated? Okay, you're getting this. Perfected or flawed? And radiant. I'll just answer that one for you, right? So you can do this. If it's like God, what is it going to be? All these good things. And sacred art and architecture are supposed to show you this reality. There are several architects who form part of a movement called deconstruction. Sounds odd for architecture. But it's based on the literary premise that texts are not reliable meaning. They, can't te they don't tell you what the author intended them to mean. So you can't know what true is. So um, what do you call this room? Oh, okay. Well, that doesn't work. But suppose you call to the St. Thomas of Beckett Parish Center. Let's practice that for a second. Is it the geographical center of the parish? Is it a sacred... If it were the Sacred Heart Parish Center, would it be a Sacred Heart Parish Center? Or would it be a Sacred Heart Parish Center? You see these multiple interpretations? 
But hell, well, how can you know what anything means? All we know is that we're bound to chaos, and so let's build chaos in architectural form. This, believe it or not, is a whole movement in architecture. Chaos is the opposite of cosmos. It's the anti-incarnational architectural philosophy that is at loggerheads with Catholic theology. And the leader of that, Frank Gehry, was one of the finalists for the Diocese of Rome's Church of the Year 2000, uh, about 10 years ago. He didn't win, uh, but they said, oh, he's up to date, cool, the church wants to be up to date, let's do that, as opposed to thinking through an architectural theology. So how can art show us heavenly realities? Look at uh, an icon, and uh, hopefully, fathers, I'll be doing this justice. But John Paul II, in his letter to artists, said that icons, by, he said by analogy, are, could be considered sacraments with a small s. And there are the seven sacraments that we all know of, instituted by Christ and guarded by the church. But sacrament, in the broad definition, is material stuff that makes invisible spiritual realities knowable to the senses. So you see a um, saint in an icon. It's not a portrait of them as they existed in their earthly life, but show the saint as they exist in heaven, freed from the passions or the disordered passions. Their passions are consumed by grace. It shows the fall undone. It's our heavenly future that's pulled back into our own time. We get to participate in it now. And it's wood, paint, gold, etc. that makes this visible to us. And remember, it's not like the stop sign. That's just a suggestion that you stop. It's the brick wall. It makes the reality of that saint's holiness present in the world. And it always requires a stable iconography. You know, St. Peter didn't walk around the Holy Land in a yellow and blue robe with perfect hair and carry keys all the time, right? That's for us to know who he was. So look at this guy. This is St. Peter the Alut from the Aleutian Islands. He's an Orthodox saint. I don't believe he's in the Western canon. Look at that nice heavy coat he has on. It doesn't mean that it's cold in heaven. It just means that we need to know who he is. But it's a perfected coat. See how it's radiating, it's glowing, it's radiating, no seal blubber all over it or whatever he might have been doing. This is St. Peter, the perfected saint. So art can show you, allow you to participate in heaven. And how do we know? Well, let's look at some of the biblical authorities. If you were alive in the time of Christ, you probably would know of this ensemble. This is the top of the Temple Mount. It's an interesting thing in reading the New Testament. Look up the word temple. How many times they talk about temple, temple, temple? They went back to the temple, John 10. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple, walking in the portico of Solomon. They went back to the temple. The lame man was cured at the beautiful gate, which was right here. And then he ran into the portico of Solomon, which was right there. And then the, and the Acts of the Apostles, they kept meeting up here, even though they were breaking bread in their homes. And it was a big classical ensemble. And if you could cut the center building of the temple open, you would see it had a porch, and a big room, and then a little room in the back called the Holy of Holies, and the Ark of the Covenant went in there, and that was the throne where God's presence dwelled with Israel. Well, let's see, have you ever been in a building that had a porch, a big room, and a little room in the back where God's presence, abiding presence, rested? Narthex, nave, sanctuary, tabernacle, right? Our churches are the fulfillment of the Old Testament time of shadow. And if you look at some of these diagrams, this is all conjecture, this was all destroyed, Nobody really knows what it looks like, but the biblical descriptions of, in Genesis, the Lord dwelled with Adam and Eve in the garden. There was no temple there. Uh, and they, but after the fall, they, Isaiah speaks of hoping for the time when the desert would become the garden again, when, the, when it would be like it was in the beginning. All of that language you read, in, particularly in the Psalms. And in the description of the temple itself, it said this big room was um, covered in carved cedar, covered in gold leaf, made with angels, the cherubim, palm trees, open flowers, roses, gourds, etc. Sometimes they even said they put gems in the walls. But you hear flowers, vegetables, plants, palm trees. What do you think of? The garden, right? Paradise. Right? If you win the lottery, what are you going to do? I'm going to buy an island in the Caribbean and sit under a palm tree. Right? That's still in our culture as an image of paradise. Adam and Eve are chased out of the garden. Architecture shows them what it would be like to come back into the garden. And these were only for the priests, by the way, in the Jewish time, uh, the time of the temple, I mean. And now the lay people as baptized have a priestly um, reality, not the same as the ordained priesthood, but we belong in this priestly room, the nave. And then the high priest would go into this room back here, the Holy of Holies, and there it was also covered in gold, and there was a veil in between, a big curtain that separated earth from heaven, where God dwelled. And the high priest would go through the veil. Maybe you remember when Christ died, the veil was torn. Yeah, actually, if you could turn down the lights a little bit, maybe it would be easier to see some of this. When Christ's body was torn, the veil was torn in two. Oh, there we go. Oh, much better, right. So 
all the grace of heaven came gushing through into the world to restore it. That's the notion of the tearing of the veil as Christ's, Christ's body was like the veil. His body um, veiled his divinity for a short while. And the veil was made of four different kinds of material. You know, I so said, that's interesting. Why did Exodus bore me with all these descriptions? Well, it was linen, partly, which represented the earth. And there was blue wool, which represented the air, purple, which was the red blood of fish and the blue water, and then scarlet, which represented fire, things like the sun and the stars. So all of creation was worn by the high priest as he went through the veil, which also represented all of creation. And there's some great traditional stories about how the Virgin Mary was actually a temple, um, lived in the temple, and she was weaving this material for the veil as she was at the Annunciation, then wove Christ in her womb. That, that was the veiling of divinity in Christ's humanity for a short time. So sometimes you see her with, a, with fabric in her hand when she's doing this, and it's a very beautiful uh, way to discuss it. And the Ark of the Covenant, this is the same Ark of Raiders of the Lost Ark, by the way. If you know about the Ark, the Israelites used to carry it through the desert, and when they had God with them, they would be military victors over their enemies, and so Hitler wanted this in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, and that's what the story is all about. Two uh, cherubim and God's presence right there on the mercy seat of the Kapareth. And you see the Lord reigns, the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. That's what they're talking about here. So the high priest would put on these very important sacramental vestments, or proto-sacramental vestments, with 12 gems on this breastplate, each one carved with the names of one of the 12 tribes of Israel, because the idea was bringing the world into the presence of God in that little room in the back would restore the world, that God's presence was holy and conferred holiness. And so he couldn't bring all the Israelites in this little room, so he wore them vicariously as, as gems and wore the name of the Lord on his forehead and had this funny tall pointy hat, which people theorize became the miter of the bishop, right? And his uh, circular garment with a hole in the top uh, became fulfilled as the chasuble and the white robe that we now use as an alb was the dress of heaven. So the high priest acted as the Lord, taking all creation onto himself, bringing it into the presence of God, including the blood of bulls and goats, and then sprinkled that blood on the people. Here we talk, pr preparation for the Eucharist, right? Bringing all the prayers of the people into the sanctuary. Think of what your priest does. Puts on beautiful vestments of creation, and then imitates this high priest by imitating Christ and going into the sanctuary, which is the new Holy of Holies. And so there you see porch, hollow bronze columns, porch, into the presence of God. Now this is not just old-timey stuff. This is very telling about what we should know about churches, because the temple was considered a mythical space and time. It was outside of time. It's where the earthly and the eternal were one inside there. And the priests were these mediators between the two worlds of heaven and earth, preparing the world for the prime mediator, who is Jesus Christ, of course. So look at a little medieval church. Porch, nave, holy of holies. Similar ground plan. And if you've ever been to St. Patrick's Cathedral, you've walked through the architectural version of a grove of trees. See these columns here? See how their branches come up and spread across there? This is the Alley of Elms in Central Park, just right up the road from there. Look around. Leaves, buds, flowers, saints, gold, radiance. This is the restored garden. Even these little side walls that just have the leaves put in these diamond patterns, they're given an overlay of geometry and proportion. So they're not just fallen earthly leaves, but it's the symbolic representation of perfected nature restored. So a church is heaven and earth come together and restored. And here's a jeweled garden where the angels live, as they say. A jewel-like thing. Remember the high priest is wearing the jewels? The angels, the saints, and then, of course, Christ would be just off to the left in this picture. <laughs> now this is a church near me. Maybe you've seen some old churches like this. Can you see any temple roots in here? I see some nodding. Tell, tell me something loud so I can hear it. We have an altar rail. That's what remains of the veil, right? It's that threshold between heaven and earth, but it's torn so you can see right through it and past it. This is in Naperville, Illinois. But they're you got married there? Hey, well, congratulations. Is that a happy memory? Okay, good. <laughs> were those two angels there when you were there? Yeah, you were probably busy that day. Um, look. 
she's saying they had taken the altar rail away and they, they brought it back. Well, look at these two angels guarding the abiding presence of God in a golden box, right? Look at these columns extending up, and you see that the temple roots are still there, even though they've been transfigured and, and fulfilled. So that's the shadow. And now we have the time of living in this place. You go to Rome, the churches are big. They have domes. They're legible. They're clear. You know that people, uh, they're at least at one time there were Christians in this place, and the architecture tells you that very clearly. And I had a little fun with Photoshop here, and here's a church with a tower, here's the same church without the tower. And towers are expensive, they don't do anything, they get hit by lightning, and they need to be tuck pointed all the time, and architects hate them, and pastoral councils hate them, and pastors hate them because they cost a lot of money. But what's the value of proclaiming Christ to the distance? You know, you have to weigh all your options and your budgets, of course, but you're talking about this thing that can be seen from a distance and calls people to itself. And even in the natural world, think about the structure of of how things work. If I were dropped in a plane and had to survive somehow, and you ever see those Bear Grylls shows where he jumps out of a plane in the wilderness and has to survive? Well, that's what I'd have to do. I'd have to, if I were able to build something like this, I'd be pretty darn proud of myself. But it's not all that great, right? See, the trees are vertical supports, diagonals this way, and some horizontals, and then the walls are made of this grassy stuff that's not really structural, but enclosed. If you've ever been camping, you know, you have the poles of the tent, and they're the structure, and the fabric is an enclosure. But if I got a little better, I could make something nicer, smooth it out, give it some proportions, tie it together with ropes, and develop the architecture to be more sophisticated. And if I got really good, I could turn those into beautiful columns, and they have scrolls on the top, and they have grooves on the side, and they're based on proportional systems of height to width, and they actually decrease in width as they come to the top to appear to be more slender and graceful. So, you know, this is kind of like a weightlifter. Ugh, I lift heavy thing over my head, right? This is a ballet dancer lifting a woman over his head. Both work, but one is graceful and poetic, and one is literal and structural. But there's still a structural logic to both of them. You can see it going on here. Look at all these beams coming across and they come down to the wall. There's a structural logic of this room. Uh, You could discuss how poetic it is, but it's there, right? This is the logic of architecture. And then there are little remnants. This is a little garage near where I live and these guys hang out on Friday nights and fix cars and drink beer and stuff. And sort of homemade building, pretty nice. Look at these beams that support the roof. You see them sticking out of the edge. This is not the best arrangement. They're not quite even. They have a little triplet there in the middle. But imagine you could give it an overlay of geometry and harmony and proportion, and you'd start to see these roof beams come out. And then this is the chapel of the seminary where I teach. These little blocks up here called medallions. A couple of them fell off in the bad Chicago winters there. Uh, But that is the suggestion of the remnants of structure, but in a poetic form. And uh, any musicians in the room? Have you heard of architecture as frozen music? Have you ever heard this? 
Well, think about this. this these little blocks have a rhythm. Da, 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 rest, da, 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 right? So think of this symphony. This is the string, the tall bass, right? With these long notes, and then da, 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 da. There's a mathematical relationship to all the parts in a building that can be harmonic or it can be chaotic. And even the little pieces. See these little beams that would be up there on the roof represented by these things called dentals. And then there's all this stuff. We'll talk about that in a second. This is one of my favorite stories. This is the sixth grade boy favorite story because it deals with blood and guts. But there's this guy, George Hersey. He wrote a great book called The Lost Meaning of Classical Architecture. And he said, we put all these columns that were the pagan temples. Why do we do this? And he started looking at the words for these little blocks here, for instance. See them right here? It's called a triglyph, and it means, tri means three, and a glyph means a, a line, like a hieroglyph, or a thing chopped. And he said, what is this thing that's been chopped? And he found out that in ancient Greek temple rituals, they bring a bull up there, and they would, take, they would kill the animal and drain the blood and all that, and they would take the skull out and put it up on the building, because that's where the life-giving qualities was in the brain, but then also in the thigh bone, because it was big and it had a lot of marrow in it. So they would cut it in three parts, tie a tendon around it, wrap it in marrow and fat, and hang it on the wall. Which is a little creepy, I know. But then, I guess they got messy and they stopped doing that literally, but they started doing it architecturally. There are three pieces of a thigh bone, there are the little drops of marrow and fat coming out. And this molding, to this day, is called the tania, which is the Greek word for tendon. So why the heck would the Christians start using this? Well, here's an architecture of unbloody, Ritual sacrifice of a victim. Ah, they said. God prepared the pagan world to give us an articulate kind of architecture that speaks of the ritual sacrifice that is a way you can understand the Eucharist. So the 12 uh, tribes of Israel have pagan correspondences in the 12 signs of the zodiac, by the way. And I'm not, not promoting Gene Dixon. I'm just saying this was the preparation for the reception of Christianity. And then even things like this. I'm sure you've seen this Vitruvian man, it's called. Uh, they put a picture of this on one of those space capsules that went out into outer space. So that if they met any aliens, they would know we have four arms and four legs. <laughs> <laughs> and that we fit into a square. So, you know, if you don't have Twister at home, you can do this at parties. Measure your height and measure the width from fingertip to fingertip, and they should be just about the same. And if you swing your arms around from your belly button, you make a diameter of a circle. And that's how they relate to each other. And so people would say, ah, human body, image of God, reveals the mind of God. Well, let's use those circles and squares to develop the proportions of the facade of a church. So here's the square, here's the square cut in half, and then these circles give places for windows and doors. That gives order, harmony, and cosmos to what otherwise was a pile of rocks, right? Think about it. A stone church was the side of a hill. Somebody went there, cut down the trees, took the stone, cut it into pieces, gave it number, proportion, measure, weight, and it revealed the mind of God. You see, this is a sharing in the creative powers of God. That's what our Imago Dei means. So we can take the dust of the earth and turn it into something more than it was. That's an, an allegory, uh, not an allegory, an analogous relationship to God who took the dust of the earth and made Adam. And even conventions like this. Anybody been to Rome, seen this? The Arch of Constantine, right? Constantine, the first Christian emperor, so they didn't destroy his triumphal arch. But a triumphal arch was a big hole in the city wall, essentially. Uh, you know, what, now we just we come into a new city, you see the sign, you know, rest in population, whatever, and you know you're there. In those days, there was a wall around the city to keep out vandals and bad guys, and to come in the city meant you were uh, someone who was either a citizen and be or belonged there. So you could be a farmer out there and bring in your cart of lettuce, and to be let in the city was to be having a certain recognition. If you were the emperor and you just had a great military victory and you're coming back, they build you a really nice hole in the wall, right? <laughs> so the emperor went through the center hole and then all of his uh, side links, people went through the side holes. This is an A, B, A relationship, if you know poet poetry terms. These two are the same and this one is bigger. And this became a symbol of triumphal entry into the city. Can you see the Christian analogy here? The triumphal entry into the heavenly city. And so the triumphal arch becomes the motif for church buildings. This is the chapel where, where I teach. They closed up these two sides, and the saints come to meet you. But here's the little arch, the big arch, and the little arch. And you can see this all the way through Christian history. 
Check out your great Gothic cathedrals. These are great little arch, big arch, little arch, and all the citizens of heaven have come in their glory and their array to come and meet you at the door. And then there are all these pesky things called columns. Uh, art historians, and you know, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, have you heard of these things before? Well, this is Tuscan, which is kind of a simple Doric. This is Doric with its little bloody bones on top. And there's the scrolls of the Ionic, the leaves of the Corinthian, and then the scrolls of the Ionic and the leaves of the Corinthian combined into the composite, as they're called. Now, there's a hierarchy from left to right. Tuscan is low, composite is high, and it runs that way. So here's a quiz. What kind of columns do you think St. Peter's Basilica in Rome would use? Composite? Good thinking, but as a trick question. Because most of St. Peter's uses Corinthian, which is high, but not the highest. But the Valdichino over the altar, which is over the tomb of Peter, uses composite because it's the highest status spot within the highest status church. And so you see, using two kinds of capitals clarifies the relationship of this part to this part in a way that's delightful and beautiful, takes all the pagan tradition, but elevates it to Christian glory. And those columns, by the way, are made of bronze, and they're hollow. They're called Solomonic columns because they're columns like they thought the ones that were in front of the Temple of Solomon. Why would that matter? Well, what do, they, do you remember, what do they call Jesus in the New Testament? Jesus, son of David. Who's the son of David? Solomon. Who built the temple? Solomon. Who's building the new temple, which is the mystical body of Christ? Jesus. So Jesus is the new Solomon. And then since Christ is up in heaven, he sends the Holy Spirit to help us understand that Peter is taking that role as his vicar and building up the new temple of the church. Plus, it's really cool to look at. This is the equivalent of a nine-story building from here to here, and it's bronze, which means they had to melt metal, put it into molds, have it not crack, get it there, put it back together, and they actually hired the cannon makers of Rome to make these. They were used to making big metal objects like that. And look, Cephas, James, and John in Galatians are called pillars of the church. And I imagine that's what you are. You're here, right? You're probably on the committees. You bake things for the bake sale. You collect money as an usher, whatever it happens to be. That symbol of keeping the upkeep of the church together is represented in the building as well. And columns are people, by the way. Do you know what the top of a column is called? Capital, right? Can you guess when you decapitate someone, right? Off of their head. Per capita income. So columns have heads. And they also have bases, and the word base, basis in Greek means a foot. It also means a dance, specifically the dance of the women who are going up the path to the temple. So it's a liturgical dance. They also have pedestals, pede, pedestrian, pedals, right? Even pediatricians, they're people who work with little ones learning to walk. So columns have heads and they have feet. And here they made it very clear that these columns were represented as women. And there's a story about this, that the uh, women of this Greek town, Carrier, were taken into slavery after the other Athenian city-states defeated them. They killed their husbands, and then they took them into slavery of the Athenian state. And they wanted to show them as slaves of the state in architecture. Here's the invisible political reality, and they're wearing what's called widow's dress because they wanted people to know that they were married women. And so they have their hands tied behind their backs like slaves. Now, Vitruvius, the only book from the ancient world to survive, tells us that their curly hairdos, they apparently had these sort of Princess Leia, cinnamon bun sort of hairdos, <laughs> those became conventionalized into the scrolls of the Ionic Column. And the folds of their widow's dress became the grooves of the Ionic Column. So here's a column that represents married women, mothers, presumably. How would a Christian take this inheritance and make something out of it? Who is the great mother of Christian history? Virgin Mary, right. So look at this. The very first church dedicated to the Virgin Mary in the history of Christianity filled with Ionic columns right down there. Every other church up to that point had used Corinthian columns because they're the highest status one, but they used these specifically for the Virgin Mary. And columns come in all shapes and sizes, just like people do. <laughs> I got this guy's permission to use this. Uh, some people are barrel-chested, some are not. My friend Gary, look, his payday, well, his pest, his little foot, is the height of that pedestal. He's about as wide as this, and the capital is almost as tall as his head, except it's a little bit, he's a little short. This is at the University of Virginia, by the way. And then there's all this other funky stuff on buildings, right? Swags, leaves, there's that bull skull we were talking about before. And the theory was, coming from ancient Greece, that if you're having a big festival time, 
you hang stuff on the walls, and it's kind of strange, right? What do you do when you have a birthday party? Oh, crepe paper, streamers. You put candles on a cake and sing a funny song and blow them out. Isn't that weird? At right, Christmas, you cut down a really perfectly happy pine tree and bring it inside, and you put popcorn and cranberries on a string and hang it on a tree. This is weird, no? But this is how we understand festivity. We hang things on things. You hang things on yourself. You hang things on other things. And look at all the things you can hang on things. <laughs> Aha! What's happening here? Well, ha you know these people. You were there that day. No! <laughs> this is the convention. We hang swags and ivy and flowers. And look at they threw rose petals all over the grass and more fabric. And these people went berserk, right, with all that fabric. <laughs> If, you, if your kitchen looked like this, people would think you were weird. But on the wedding day, you can get away with almost anything, right? Including watermelon in the shape of a swan. Festive, enriching, even of the food. Martha Stewart did it too, look at that. And somebody went a little nuts over here in Christmas time. It's weird stuff. But this is how we indicate festivity. And as the liturgy... Sorrowful and boring, or is it festive? It's festive, right? We're celebrating the victory over sin and death. And so churches are having signs of festivity. If you walk down you know, the streets in New York, you can see in the garment district all these beaded trims and different things you can buy to put on your own self. And columns do it too. Look at the scrolls of this woman's hairdo. have little flowers and leaves in it, and little leaves across here. This one's wearing a necklace, right? Look at that. Here's the head, and here's the neck, and it's got beads right around it, and up there as well. So the, the building is decorated for the wedding feast of the Lamb, the way a bride might be decorated on her own wedding day. Or you can get completely crazy and start making capitals in the shape of the four evangelists. Well, that's pretty cool. Or you can go really nuts and put snails and lizards and turtles and snakes and water lilies in your capital. Can you guess where this might be? At the zoo, right? This is the Lincoln Park Zoo Reptile House. <laughs> this is the conventional Roman capital. This is how it's adapted for its time and place. Just because you do traditional doesn't mean it has to all look the same. Okay, so we're winding down here. We, wanna, we've, we saw the shadow, we saw our own time, and then participating in the realities of heaven. How do you know? Well, Vatican II wants us to do it. I've hit this a couple times. Foretaste of the heavenly liturgy, signs and symbols of heavenly realities. That's what we're participating in. And right in the beginning of Sacrosanct and Concilium, it says, the active participation of the faithful is the aim to be considered before all else. Well, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Participation in the liturgy is what makes you heavenly. Being heavenly makes you worthy to be in heaven. Of course, that's the consideration before all else. Now, this doesn't just mean everybody should be busy all the time. It means they should be participating in the heavenly liturgy. How do you know what heaven looks like? Well, the book of Revelation tells us, and this is very strong in the Eastern Catholic and Orthodox traditions, and this is really where John Paul's breathing with both lungs can bring us some ideas. What does the book of Revelation say? There was a throne in heaven with one seated on the throne, and around the throne a rainbow that looks like an emerald, and these um, 24 elders in white robes, they're wearing the dress of heaven with crowns of victory. And then this great multitude, all these other people, right? Every nation, every tribe, all the languages, all standing before the throne. It's populated, it's ordered, and they're standing before the throne of God. So they're theocentric, all focused on God. And then a little later, this is every architect's dream, right? There's a tour of heaven. The angel takes John, and they have a measuring rod of gold to measure heaven. And it turns out that it's the same as it is in length and width and height. So what is heaven? A cube, or at least symbolically cubic, and then look what it's made of. Gold, jasper, and 12 different kinds of gems. 12 kinds of gems from the breastplate of the high priest in the temple. Now it's not vicariously representing the 12 tribes of Israel, but heaven itself is made of the living stones. That's us, right? On earth, we participate in it by way of the image of the building, but someday that will be our reality. And here they are, the 12 gems. And if you go to the internet, you can find all kinds of crackpot theories about which gem is which. Uh, apostle, but the apostle is the successor of the 12 tribes, and then they go out into the world to bring grace to the world and transform the whole world into a right-ordered community that's radiant, colorful, and gem-like. doesn't mean heaven is a cube in the sky. It means that heaven is in the shape of God, and we are part of that. So look at this church. 
Maybe you've been there in Venice, St. Mark's. Every square inch covered in gold, radiance, gems, heavenly beings, heaven, earth, nature, all kinds of plants. Here's the one seated on the throne. And here's something to remember. This is a great, uh, Paul F. Dokimov, a great theologian of the Eastern tradition, he says it's perfectly legitimate to search for new forms in architecture. Nothing wrong with that. But every one of them expresses a symbolic content that remains the same because it has a heavenly origin. I said this to the architects at CUA today, they didn't know what I was talking about. I saw their heads all explode right out there. <laughs> Heavenly origin, what do you mean? I thought it's a history of this, and it looks like old stuff, and what I learned in architecture school, and steel beams. Okay, fine. Origin of the liturgy is the heavenly liturgy. Origin of the church building is the heavenly Jerusalem. So you see churches through history. St. Peter's, see those little scrolly columns right there? Right there? These were the ones that they modeled the Baldacchino in the current St. Peter's on. And you see Santa Prasede also in Rome. 400 years later, jeweled walls of the heavenly Jerusalem, white-robed elders carrying crowns. There's the one on the lamb, the lamb on the throne. There's the baptism of Christ. So Christ's earthly life combines with his eternal reality and then with our participation in it. So time conflates. The past comes forward to a person who visits this church. And heaven comes backward to a person who visits this church. So we for have a foretaste of our own glorious future. Go to a great Gothic church like the Saint Chapelle. The walls are almost gone, right? There's just these little piers, these little columns. Can you guess how many there are? Twelve, yes, twelve primary pillars of the church. And so there's a statue of each of the apostles on each one. And then look what happens in between. The walls disappear into a gem like, radiant screen of stained glass, which not only looks like gems, but it, the light actually comes through it. And the book of Revelation says there's no sun and no moon in heaven because it's the light of Christ that gives the light of heaven. And so a traditional icon will never show a deep shadow cast across a face of a saint because it's the light that radiates out from them that um, makes them look iconic. So here's the building becoming an icon of heaven. And even these sorts of things, texts, right? How does a building praise God? It does it by putting texts on it. And all the things we've talked about before, the heavenly beings, the structure elaborated in a poetic way, all the illusions, there's one of the four evangelists on the four corners of the dome. And then you get to the 19th century, and then we start to get into our own time. There was this guy, Pugin, English guy, very famous in art historical circles, and he really liked the Middle Ages. He said the 19th century was full of factories and unhappy people and Dickensian workhouses, and we needed a little bit of heaven. So look what he did. Angels with incense, described in the book of Revelation, everything covered in pattern, gold, gem-like qualities, even the tiles on the floor made to look like the jeweled streets of heaven. You can see them here. Leaves, flowers, the garden, 
all the colors of gems. And this was his dream, right? A perfect sort of requiem mass with monks chanting at his own death in this beautiful image of the heavenly Jerusalem. Everybody who's ever been to a Gothic church in the United States, you owe it to him. All those churches down in the city that look like this, this was his romantic mind trying to think about how heaven could have been understood in the Middle Ages. But even in the 20th century, this is the cathedral in Wheeling, West Virginia, of all places. Maybe you can start to interpret this. The one seated on the throne, surrounded by an emerald rainbow. The angels, the saints, the Holy Spirit, the starry skies of heaven, the white-robed multitudes, the river of the water of life. That's the grace of the Holy Spirit transforming the world, making the desert into the garden. Even the floor of the sanctuary there is like the jeweled streets of heaven. And they didn't have much money because they were building this during the Depression. They didn't have money for big pieces of marble, so they told the marble guy to take all the leftovers from his other jobs and arrange them on the floor, and that's what he did. As this jeweled streets... There's a theology of the church floor, can you imagine? And then there's a theology of what's up there in heaven, right? The Trinity, angels, saints. Here are those palm trees we talked about, paradise, right out of the temple, but anticipating our heavenly Jerusalem. And look, the water flowing out of the cross, coming out of these four spigots and down into the world. Maybe you like it more modern, 1960. Here's a stained glass window, no Victorian angels in it, no fussy Victorian stuff. The jeweled walls of the heavenly city all piled up. And every now and then you get a bright spot, like here and here and here and here. Those are faceted cut pieces of glass, like a diamond. And so you move your head from side to side and they flash light out at you. This active quality. And there's one of the saints amid the jeweled walls of the heavenly Jerusalem. So you can have whatever style you like, as long as it bears the weight of theology. And this is the church that it's in. Built with seating on three sides. It was right before the council, but they had some idea that this kind of congregational seating would happen. Some crazy Jetsons lamps here, by the way. Right? So he designed, this guy, Edward Schulte, designed all these lamps. Even the lamps are restored, divinized, glorified lamps. Maybe I'll put this to you. This is an altar that won a prize from a liturgy magazine. Intentionally unfinished, they said, because the body of Christ is not yet fully restored, so our altar should look broken because we're broken. Oh, ooh, what a clever theological idea. What do you think? No? Why not? Because it's supposed to represent heavenly realities, perfection, order, radiance. Not only that, the altar is Christ. Christ's body was the place where the sacrifice happened. This is the place where the sacrifice happens. If you know what happens to a cross, it gets a church, uh, an altar. It gets five consecration crosses carved in the top, suggesting the five wounds of Christ. When it's consecrated, it's blessed with, uh, sprinkled with holy water like a baptism. It's anointed with chrism like the anointing on the beard of Aaron. And to represent it as a broken table is... I'm not saying these are bad people. I'm just saying they don't get it. They don't know it. They don't understand what it's supposed to be. And then it becomes subject to every kind of strange theory that you want it to have. This is the new church I started, started with. And this is what it became when they looked at the budget. All right, so that was, that was the dream. Whoops. That was the dream. That was the reality. But if I'd shown you this first, you probably wouldn't have said, oh, what a, what a t- terrible building, right? It looks pretty good. It's $14.6 million, so it's not a cheap thing. That's the view of it. That's the baptistry right there. And they planned it from the beginning to have this great mural in it which cost $68,000. Okay, that's a lot of money. But the parking spaces cost about $4,000 each. So think about how many parking spaces it takes to have a vision of the heavenly Jerusalem. Not that many. This was a good deal. And the architects and the painters worked together from the very beginning. And you see how it turned out. The one seated on the throne, very much like the cathedral in Wheeling. And then the saints down here, um, mostly American and North American saints. There they are. There's Miguel Pro and John Newman, and you can see Mother Cabrini and Catherine Drexel and Terry Tech Aquitha and Junipero Serra. This woman here is a local blessed from Kansas. They wanted to keep it local. And then these are all those imaginary buildings of the heavenly Jerusalem, except for, look at that one. Looks a little different. I wanted them to think, heaven is not some faraway place. The earth will be restored. So I said, what's the most famous building on the skyline of Kansas City? And so they went and they found this Art Deco skyscraper, which is the utility company, and it's called the Kansas City Power and Light Building. It's perfect, (laughs) perfect, perfect. There's St. Michael. The church is called the Church of St. Michael, and the river of the water of life is coming down into our realm. And look at the floor of heaven. Look at the aisle. 
center aisle of the church. The streets of heaven are the streets of this church. The church is an image of the heavenly Jerusalem. This is tile, ceramic tile. It looks like marble. And they you know, cut a few extra cuts, so it's a little more expensive than a bunch of squares, but not that much more expensive. And that's what it looks like. You see the altar and the heavenly vision. And guess what? Big arch, little arch, uh, little arch, big arch, little arch. The triumphal gateway into heaven, and Christ is coming right through it to us, even as we are going right through it to him. And a great quote from the book of Revelation. Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell, we will be his people. He will wipe away all tears from our eyes. Come, the pastor, the pastor doesn't like this part, it says, come without payment and drink from the wells. But... Um, <laughs> That's a vision of the, the angels calling us, come, dwell, dwell with us. And imagine, you know, your own wedding day. The groom is at the far end of the church, the bride's all the way over there, and the groom cannot wait for that bride down there to get over here, right? And then there's all the wedding night stuff, I don't need to go into that. But that's the two becoming one, right? This is the image of fallen humanity, separated from God, and God is saying, come to me, come to me, come to me, in the beautiful poetic terms, where the church is the groom, Christ is the bride. And behold, the dwelling of God is with the bride, with us. And so we are being prepared. That's the dome over the baptistry. You see right there. And then the baptistry made of the same materials as the altar. And they had all kinds of bad columns on the a building on their property. If columns are people, what kind of people are these? <laughs> these are dopey and sneezy right here, right? <laughs> so if you ever want to do a classical building, hire a classical specialist because... This was another architect from the church, and he didn't understand how all of this worked. Even though the parish spent good money on it, they didn't spend it well. And there are other ways. You know, beams are carried by columns, so the seams should line up on top of columns. And There's a logic to classical architecture that kind of makes sense. And you can see when it's not done well, little things pasted on the front of a concrete block. And look at this heavy thing held up by these two little things. That doesn't make any sense at all. So the logic of architecture should be appeared to be carried by the amount of columns it needs to do what it needs to do. So we'll just finish up with this. This is the church you got married in on when it was being built. Okay? So here are a bunch of rocks. Right? Imagine we are a bunch of rocks. We're the living stones. And we were quarried out of the earth and given shape by God. The Savior Mason's hammer is a beautiful phrase. Christ shaped us. And we were all in chaos. And little by little, we start getting arranged in just in the right place. And all of a sudden, this image of heaven starts to form. That's what we are supposed to be. When you build a church, you're literally making a symbol of building up the church as an enterprise of holy people. And this is the last one. This is that church I showed you before. This is the top of the altar. There's the missal. The pelican, the bird that plucked her own feathers to feed her young with her blood, image of the Eucharist. But then look what's back here. This golden screen of Christ and the saints, angels up here, and then the jeweled walls of the heavenly Jerusalem. Maybe you can see organ pipes back there. That's where the architect put the choir. Because the choir, singing like the angels and saints, their sound would come through the golden radiant screen of the angels and saints, flow over the altar, and then down into the pews to join their voices with the people. This is 1960. This is a theology of architecture that's rich and that's deep. And not only is it that, but it's beautiful. It's, de it's delightful to go see. I heard Scott Hahn tell a story once that he was driving somewhere and he saw a father mowing the lawn. Has anybody ever heard this? And he had his little son on the, the handle of the um, lawnmower and the son thought he was mowing the lawn. and He was delighting in mowing the lawn. Of course, the father was doing all the work. And he said, that's a great analogy for what God does for us. God saves us through Christ, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But God allows us to participate in our own salvation, not by saying, I'm going to suffer until I'm ready, although suffering has value, you also get to enjoy the beauty of heaven until you become like heaven. You can, if you resist God, sometimes he'll chisel you with sharp blows. If you go with God, you can be like, a water over, like water over a rock shaped into the shape of heaven. And that comes through beauty, through theology, and art and architecture are very central to this whole mission of salvation. So I hope you carry this with you everywhere you go. If you're thinking of working in a church, remember there's a theology of church architecture, and it's a wonderful, beautiful thing to delight in. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. McNamara. I, I would like to say that I think this is one of the most excellent lectures that we've, we've hosted a lot of lectures at the Institute of Catholic Culture, but I think this is one of the finest. Um, I want to thank you for that. Thanks. 
How many church architects do we have in the room? I didn't think so. My dear friends, what Dr. McNamara has talked about tonight is not something for buildings alone. It is by extension for buildings, but it's primarily for you and for me that we are the living stones of the body of Christ. And it is our job to go out into the world and to communicate the Garden of Eden, the divine life to the world. Without us, it won't happen. And that's how I began. And I... I didn't know where the good doctor was going to go with his talk, but I was very pleased because uh, if there's anything that I desire to communicate to those that come to the Institute of Catholic Culture, it is that you have been chosen by God for a mission. And it is a mission which is a divine mission to become the image of Jesus Christ to the world, the living stones of the body of Christ. Uh, not to remain in the church, but to go out into the world. And, and I, I want to thank you, doctor, for the, for the talk, and I want to encourage you to take this home and to take it into your workplaces to take it to your friends okay we're gonna have just a short as as usual short question and answer for those that are new tonight i have a, a few rules uh, i'm gonna add one tonight and that is let's not go after any particular churches that we might know within the area okay there's a reason why we wanted to have uh dr mcnamara speak here at, uh, in the Arlington Diocese um, and uh, to enlighten our own minds as to what we should have. I ask you, keep your questions to one sentence if you have to take a breath. It's too long. That it has to do with the talk itself and that at the end of your sentence... Thank you. There's a question mark. Um, Dr. McNamara, what are gargoyles? I know what they are when I see them, but what are gargoyles? Gargoyles are these you know, creepy-looking, demonic, animal, human figures, usually on the outside of Gothic architecture. Properly speaking, a gargoyle is a thing that's like a channel for water, and the water would be cast away from the building and away from the foundation so that it wouldn't land. But there are no gargoyles inside a church, because these are all the unhappy beings that are outside the church, and so they often look unhappy. There's that famous one in Notre Dame that's you know, all angry. Uh, sometimes you see things like that that don't spew water, and those are called chimeras. So, properly speaking, a gargoyle, it's actually related etymologically to the word gurgle, because the water um, goes through it. Would you comment, please, on the current um, church architecture in Europe? In particular, I'm thinking of the uh, San Giovanni Rotondo new church um, devoted to Padre Pio, and, and you mentioned the... the the new the church the new church in Rome that was supposed to be extremely au courant. Well, traditional architecture is uh, kind of like the ugly stepsister of the American Institute of Architects. 
The architecture field is almost completely dominated with a rabid zeal by modernist-oriented people. There, there are other people in between who will just do whatever anybody pays them to do, and that's okay too. Uh, but the leadership of the field of architecture, very interested in enlightenment principles, particularly that the spirit of our age is defined by that which is dominant in our age. And traditionally, the 20th century was understood as the age of industry, engineering, mechanical things, machines for living in, and so on. So if your architecture is to be true to its age, it has to be true to what's dominant in the age. Mass production, industry, steel, glass, concrete, the, the, the materials of industry. So Europe is still very much more caught up in that than we are. I think they have so much traditional architecture, they don't feel the need for it as much. In the U.S., we don't have so much of it. And so we're much more, Americans are much more friendly to traditional architecture than Europeans are, and we could see that today at the Catholic University of America conference. All the Italians had steam coming out of their ears every time Duncan Stroick talked about columns and that sort of thing. Um, it's a funny time. Where, uh, you know, Europe has a particular history of rejecting its own cultural inheritances. You know, Germany is still recovering from World War II and Hitler and all that. How can you like your country and your traditions if that's what it brought you? There's all kinds of cultural things at work. Um, so little by little, hopefully, I, that's why I don't talk about style very much. You notice I didn't say style at, really at all. But what are the, the biblical principles that can be used to build architecture in whatever style it happens to be? We enjoyed your talk so much tonight, thank and thank you. Would you comment on why it's so important for a Catholic church, an authentically Catholic church, to look very different from other ecclesiastical structures? Do you mean structures of other denominations that we're talking about? Okay. Well, architecture is the built form of theology. If I had a button maker, I'd make buttons and give them out. Architecture is the built form of theology, and there's a correspondence between what we believe and what we um, built. And uh, I don't like to do this, but if you really were into this, I just wrote a book about all this stuff, and it's called Catholic Church Architecture and the Spirit of the Liturgy. And there's a line that I put in there. Lex, maybe you've heard Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi. The church prays as she believes. I said Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi, Lex Edificandi. She prays as she believes and she builds as she prays and believes. And so if you believe that material, the matter of the world, is good because the fall weakened us but it didn't absolutely corrupt our goodness, you will believe that material can be a bearer of divinity. If you come from a theological tradition that says Anything good about creation was shattered and destroyed in the fall, which comes particularly out of the Lutheran and Calvinist traditions, then you'll be distrustful of art and architecture as a revealer of divinities. So you have, in the Catholic and Orthodox tradition, creation is good, matter is good. It be, Christ took on matter in his own body, and then at the transfiguration, not only did it reveal God, but it revealed the glory of God. Christ's body didn't disappear at the transfiguration. It became radiant with divine life, and that's how he appeared at the resurrection, and that's how we will appear at the resurrection of, of, of the dead at the end of time. So that's one of the serious logical differences. Strangely, the leader of the renewal of Catholic architecture in the 1970s was a radical anti-sacramental Lutheran. And that's not an accident, because he denied the value of creation. And he, in fact, wrote a book saying we had to return to the non-church. And we built a lot of non-churches at that time. And so now we're figuring out what we should be doing. Could you comment, please, about uh, I mean, the placement of the people in, in the church? Uh, traditionally, uh, pews are supposed to be sort of uh, everybody's facing the front and all that, but uh, many new church, well, new, new style churches will be uh, sort of semicircular, even circular. There is no one right way to arrange seats. Period. Now, the idea of the fan-shaped seating started way before Vatican II. This was coming in the 20s and 30s in Europe and the 40s and 50s in the United States. And the idea was, they were looking at the history of the world since the 18th century, and they said, French Revolution, they put a prostitute on the altar of Notre Dame and worshipped her as a goddess of reason. What happened to the divine life that's supposed to be transforming the world? Something is messed up here, right? If we're going to Mass, and yet we're not transforming the world, we must not be receiving all the grace we should in the full, conscious, active, and fruitful way. You know, that's the language that came 200 years later. And so the liturgical movement, which was this whole great array of thinkers in the 18th, 19th, and mostly early 20th centuries, said, how do we draw deeply from the wells of divine life and the sacraments? And they loved pictures of deer drinking from running streams and birds drinking out of cups for that reason. And so they said, well, people might, they can't see what's going on, they can't understand the Latin, and they can't hear very well. 
how can we get them closer to the source of their own sanctification by having them understand what's going on at the altar, which was not the same as putting people on three sides and looking at each other. Right? That came in the 70s. These were just thinking, well, if the church is wider, then it doesn't have to be longer and more people can be close to it. That was good, solid theology. However, it got a little distorted in the 70s to say that a goal of a church was to look at each other because it was a climate of hospitality in which people felt comfortable with each other, as opposed to the understanding of the mystical body of Christ, where the priest acts in persona Christi Capitis, the head of the body, the mystical body members being the people in the pews. So the head and the body are one unit, and that's what they're pushing. You can, you can participate actively. In fact, Pius XII, do you know how he de- defined active participation? Intimate union with Christ. That, that was active participation because you would take yourself... You join yourself mentally and emotionally with the priest and offer yourself on the patent because the priest is offering Christ to the Father. You're a member of the mystical body of Christ. You're offering yourself for your own immolation and rebirth better than you were before. And they thought if you could see and hear better, you'd be better at doing that. You transform the world. You wouldn't have World War I, which was a Christian civil war. You wouldn't have World War II, which is a Christian civil war. You wouldn't have the depression where people were treating each other badly and nuclear war and all that urgency of the mid-20th century. And I know it's a long answer to a short question, but it's much more complicated than, than people often give it credit for. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. For more information, recorded programs, or schedules of upcoming events, visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org.